So um, we have with us tonight three very special speakers. I know you know them. They've been uh, longtime friends of FMBR. Um, doctors uh, James and Desiree. Desiree, I'm sorry, I just <laughs> like her tack. Um, they are social scientists who have written numerous books and um, uh, made many videos, and they are the founders of sorry, the um, Academy for Future Sciences, which is an NGO um, in association with the United Nations. Dr. Her talk here is the author of the Book of Knowledge, The Keys of Enoch, translated into over 25 languages. Um, he's the co-author of The End of Suffering with Russell Targ here, who's sitting in the front row. Um, together, the Her talks have produced numerous films and music projects, providing an in-depth look at science and the experience of consciousness development. So the way we're, we've got this organized, it's gonna be in two parts. Um, Dr. Hertak is going to introduce Dr. Rauscher, um, a colleague, and then uh, she'll do the first part and then they will do the second part. So please welcome them all. Thank you. Um, you have your own. Thank you. Okay. We thank you. We have a wonderful program this evening. It's my great honor with Desiree to introduce our beloved colleague, Elizabeth Rauscher. Many of you know she's really one of the great female scientists in the world. Over 450 published papers. Now counting those, quote unquote, I say this in jest, in the black. But she's had a terrific background. Many of you know that she got her Bachelor's of Science at the University of California, Berkeley, in physical chemistry and physics. She went on to get her master's in uh, new engineering. And then Glenn Seberg was on her, her uh, team when she pushed forward to get degrees, not only in nuclear engineering, but astrophysics. And she has had this wonderful background for her PhD in multiple subjects. And one of the great, uh, shall we say, scientists uh, at the University of California said she had too much knowledge and too many disciplines, and she was too creative. <laughs> Carl Sagan said she's a threat to the scientific community. <laughs> and that's published someplace. <laughs> of course, Elizabeth, uh, there's so many things that you've been involved with. I had opportunity to meet you through mutual friends, Andre Puharich and others on the East Coast, Dr. Glenn Wolves, who worked behind the scenes with some of the mind over matter studies and uh, ESP studies that I was connected with. But here, you've been able to really show your brilliance, not only as a delegate to the United Nations regarding uh, issues of population growth, but also infinite energy sources. You've had the opportunity also to work at Stanford Research Institute, with Russell Targ, Errol Pudoff, and other luminaries. And you have had the opportunity to also attend major conferences and summits all throughout the world, particularly in Brazil and in Europe, dealing with cosmological models, plasma physics, biomedical engineering with your late husband, Dr. Bill Baez, and of course, in geophysics monitoring. Needless to say, we could talk about your great accomplishments for many minutes and hours, but we want to really push the envelope this evening with our limits of time and space. And so I'm going to turn this over to you and they acknowledge that you have really put as the, where the paradigm of the female scientist on, on home plate. And if anyone really deserves accolades of applause for what you've done for females in the world of science, it's you. So we honor you very much. We respect you as a friend and colleague for over 40 years. And tonight we're going to be talking about the science of consciousness, part one, remote viewing universal connection and mind dynamics. And this is, of course, the title of a book that we published a couple years ago. It's available in the back table, Mind Dynamics in Space and Time. Without further ado, we turn this program, part one, over to Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. It's wonderful to see so many wonderful people and wonderful faces and hi. <laughs> I, like, I, I like people of any age that searches for truth and knowledge throughout the universe and may there be some for all of us. Anyway, it's a great pleasure to be here and I want to compliment and express my interest in our work together with JJ and Desiree Hurtat 
and some of the wonderful work that they're doing. Russell Targ and Patty Targ and the wonderful work that he's done. And I'm going to talk about three different things today. I'm going to talk about remote viewing and remote perception and our non-local connection with all existence. Then I'm going to talk about the theories of how this is happening, that we're all locally connected and every thought has real consequences. So that means think good thoughts or else. Now, there isn't any all or else, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, you know, um, as Bill and I used to say, when we, my late husband and I, we can eat dessert first because mommy and daddy aren't here. <laughs> so this is about the work that we've done on local long distance and precognitive remote viewing and a whole series of experiments I worked on at SRI, my fundamental physics group, and um, uh, David Kaiser wrote a book on how the hippies save physics on our contribution to quantum computing and a new view of quantum mechanics. I'll talk a little about that. And some other work I've been working in the medical field. And Desiree and JJ are going to talk about a whole variety of topics, but include some of the new medicine, the gentler medicine, combining the mechanical, when you break a leg, go get it set and don't call in a shaman because you're wasting his time. But he could do it, but you know. It's, uh, and uh, the pill biochemical view of taking a medication and a third leg of medicine the electromagnetic medicine, which were on the threshold of a horizon of a new medical modality that's gentler, kinder, more synergistic, not allopathic with side effects, and less expensive for those who are working or considering that. Okay, so we're <laughs> studying here. The main issue is what is reality, and it was funded by the other CIA, the Consciousness Investigation Association. <laughs> In other words, basically it was funded by me. <laughs> <laughs> Science is knowledge ascertained by observation, experiment, and retesting hypothesis, uh, hypothesization and brought under general laws and principles. Whereas mysticism is the belief that the most reliable source of knowledge or truth is true or truth is intuition rather than reason or the scientific method. Immediate and true knowledge is obtained by direct experience and does not depend on a systematic mental activity except it may involve about 50 to 80 years of meditation. <laughs> I found 30 years saved my life. What we're dealing with is to study the attributes and properties of consciousness, particularly its non-local interaction, and bringing them together under the principles of science and everyday activity. But it is part of what we experience every day and actually. And I love this saying by Ernest Rutherford, experiment without inspiration or imagination, without recourse to experiment can accomplish little, but a happy blend of the two powers, observation, experimentation, and direct inspiration, because that's behind all knowledge. And that's me at the Bevatron uh, in my um, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory days. And no, I did not run all that equipment at once. But I did do uh, some experiments at the Bevatron for three years. And I had MIT groups and all groups from all kinds of uh, California Institute of Technology come in and have me uh, uh, focus the beam. 
areas of scientific research, Lawrence Brooklyn National Laboratory, my fundamental physics group with 40 physicists, the work at Stanford Research Institute and Russell Talk and Hal Poff and also Jack Hal from Los Angeles. I've conducted over 100 experiments with approximately about 200 million to one against chance. I mean, if you summarize all the work that's done on remote viewing, it's better than the Higgs particle. Probably at least five, what would you say, five sigma? Yeah. And there we are. Uh, you can see what we looked like when we uh, were less mature. And uh, so, me, Hal Portoff, and Russell Targ in the front row, and Ed May in the back row. And um, actually, we look pretty serious. <laughs> you know, science is very serious, my dear. We can have no interference with the up to Libra stain and all them things. Oh, no, it's just oh. I told that thing was uh, that had a notion. See, gravity doesn't exist. Things just take a notion. <laughs> That's what the uh, Greeks, ancient Greeks, said. They just have a propensity to fall towards Earth. <laughs> but Newton and Einstein changed all that, and that's what we did at SRI. If we changed the view of consciousness. So what is the remote viewing activity? You have a subject that someone free for lunch to do the experiment if you're unfunded. If you're funded, you still may be the secretary or engineer down the hall. Uh, people were gifted and also we had people that were not so, that didn't claim to be gifted psychically and they did very well. So uh, then you have a monitor in the laboratory who throws your cell phone out. And um, the laboratory room with tape recorder, now it could be uh, any media to record information, a pen and paper to draw pictures or impressions. An outbound team that goes and chooses a randomly chosen target. We use geographical targets, and Ingo Swan was instrumental in developing that with Russell Targ. And an outbound experiments go to a target 30 minutes away for local remote viewing, spend 15 minutes being conscious at a target. Uh, someone trying to replicate the work, the subject draw who are the girls and said Hawaii when it was actually a, a, a drive-in diner. The reason is because the outbound experiment was fuming about an ex-husband in Hawaii. So you can't fume about anything. You actually have to be present somewhere at, uh, for 15 minutes. It's actually a challenge for some people, for others, piece of cake. Um, whoops. Uh, OK, Pro pushed the wrong button, Ron. That was the nuclear bomb. Uh, subject uh, to, to taken to the target for feedback after experiments. And the feedback's very important. Judging of subjects either by computer programs or having physical people decide on being a judge that's blind to the target pool, the target locations, and the subject's mentation until that information is given. Then they choose which person describes the target. And I'll give some examples of remote viewing with the target pool so you can see how unique the description is. And there's computer programs now that are being utilized, but it's very hard to say how many trees are where, or what, what's the probability of a tree being at a target. But often the distinction is between inside and outside. The first remote viewing I did was Jeff Michelov was a subject, Russell Targ was a um, mentor in the laboratory with him, and they, uh, it was the Oregon overpass at El Camino Real and University. No, no, this one's the Oregon overpass. What it looks like to me is like I, when I got there, it's sort of like a church uh, uh, front door, 
and that's what it looked like. And this is what um, Jeff said. He said, um, let's see, oh, I didn't even hit those buttons. <laughs> ah. Uh, okay, that's the rest of my talk. <laughs> Short, sweet. <laughs> okay, my thumb is too big or the push button is too small. But since I'm perfect in that case, I am, but I think I'm imperfect too. Okay, so what Jeff Michelow said, Elizabeth Rauscher is cold and forgot her sweater. And that's what I thought. Oh, darn, it's cold. I forgot my sweater. Okay, so this is what he drew. Two outbound experimenters on the left. I'm afraid to use, oh, maybe I'll use this one. And uh, that's the first drawing he did. And he says, I see clothes-like hangers with no clothes on them. And he said, I see yellow and pink flowers, which are on a hillside. Then I looked up and was with my clip pad to make notes. And I was feeling the uh, cyclone fence. And it looked like lines against the blue sky, and that's what he said on his tape. And then about two-thirds of the way through the experiment, a nice elderly cop with shorts on came up to me and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, there's a subject back at SRI remote viewing us. And so I explained in detail about the experiment, and he looked at me, and he called his buddy on down the cop car, and. He said, this is a 50-50. I walked away. <laughs> what was so interesting, I found out later, a 50-50 meant crazy but harmless. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a lovely one. Now we started doing long distance experiments that Russell suggested. Gary Langford was the subject to engineer down the hall and uh, was free for lunch. What, what, what I like to do is take them out for tuna fish or egg salad sandwiches and then do the remote viewing so they're satisfied and happy. And, and so um, what it was is the underpass at El Camino Real and University Avenue. And he said it's like a long tunnel. And uh, this is right hand drawing and then that left hand drawing. And Hal Putoff and I were outbound. We leaned over the edge listening to the traffic and yelling, Gary Langford, we're here at El Camino Real and University Avenue. And so back in New Orleans, uh, the subject uh, uh, drew this drawing. And then this is, that drawing looks very much like that. And he did, I, I can't see any errors in it because if you're directly there, you draw about the same thing. And this was a remarkable experiment where Russell talks the outbound experiment, Gary Langford's the subject, I'm the mentor, and the target, and I'll show you the target pool, the target came up, Louisiana Superdome. Now, Gary Langford and I were not very sportsmanlike in terms of, we didn't know what it was. So Gary Langford says, I see this dome, and there's green grass, but it has no uh, sand trap, so it's not a golf course. He said, it looked like a flying saucer that landed in the middle of the city. And I'm at SRI with him, and I'm thinking, probably not a flying saucer. <laughs> but don't interrupt a person's train of thought, because often it's about uh, analogies. So he said it was an auditorium-like setting and drew the picture here. This is from the Superdome people. And what it is is a, is a circular theater. There's uh, display cases in the front part of it, which is true. And he said, Russell can't go inside. But I can tell you what's inside. And he even des uh, described how it was set in the middle of the city and even drew the freeway in the downtown area accurately. 
and uh, he could be a cryptographer and do maps. Now this is the other targets. It sure doesn't look like that. And the French Quarter doesn't look like this train or the causeway over Lake Pontchartrain or this church or the, it's called the Moonwalk, the Sidewalk uh, Artists. And these were the other targets that were in uh, Russell's target pool where he randomly chose the right one, the right target for Gary to describe. So who causes whom? Did Gary cause Russell to go there or did Russell go there and Gary drew the drawing? So that's fun to think about. I, I threw a die on the pavement to choose the one I went to. I thought you were using, I got, I got <laughs> fancy. I was using a random number generator because, you know, technology, I was coming in and we needed to. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's, I know, it's amazing. Anyway, this is the one with the Berkeley Research Group that I put together. And the subject was an oil explorer who wanted to learn remote viewing to find oil wells. And the, the target is a, an overpass of a freeway with uh, uh, four, lines, uh, four lanes each way. So what, he, what the subject said is, I see a 57 Chevy, and then laughed, and then drew this freeway with the lanes, and that uh, work against the sky. Very good rendition, you know. And then this is one where Hella Hammered was Russell's control, a friend of his who's an artist. And so she was going to be the one that's totally skeptic, could never do a remote viewing, of course. But the key is to open your mind to the possibility. It's called shelving information, not making a judgment too soon. Now, example is UFOs and UFO phenomena. I have done a few cases on that. I have no idea what's going on, but I know I don't know. So I don't judge yes or no. And what happened was I went, uh, Hella described, I sat in the parking lot in the car while Hella described Macy's department store. And she said it had a big archway with a carri co carriage could draw through. New bricks with, uh, you could see the white between the bricks, the masonry. And she, it was new at the time. It's not new anymore. But I also got the jacket that I wore in the picture in front of the Bevatron there. Kind of neat. So anyway, she, I, I wait, she draws this, and then I go there and pick it out of six targets. Now, when I get back, I said, my God, that's a hit. Tell me the rest of my future, and we'll just you know close for the day. <laughs> These were the other targets. The Vallambrosa Gross uh, uh, Center, the underpass at El Camino Real and University Avenue, which you could use the same target uh, in different pools, and then the nice cement factory, which is lovely. And I went to the Chamber of Commerce when I first started working at SRI, and I said, I need target pools targets for a target pool for remote viewing. So I went to the chamber, that's exactly what I said. But I explained further that I wanted unique characteristic locations that a person could tell one thing from another. Okay, so this is a total of about, a, well, we've done more recent experiments, but uh, this includes the work that I had done in 75, 76 to 1980. This line is the local remote viewing. This line is long distance, so you can see we had more investment there. This is chance. We only had two experiments at chance. This line kept improving because it's a learning process. And it's like when my cousins came down and they were shooting pistols. They played guitars one year, next year shooting pistols. 
So we would go out to garbage dumps and, you know, the thing was to shoot the glass balls because you know you hit something. So at first, I'm cavalier. I do really well. But the harder I try, the worse I got. So it's like a J-curve. <laughs> and then you have to learn to relax to do it into it. And this is a whole series of experiments, two experiments from a whole series I did with J.J. and Desiree, the Dr. Hertax. And what it was is uh, in this one, I couldn't get any impression. Normally I close my eyes like a screen and you see the image. And I even ask psychics how they perceive things. It's like a screen and close your eyes and you see these images and you draw pictures. So I wasn't getting any impressions. And then I saw this lion statue, and this is the second sphinx, which was the target. So I didn't have much erroneous information. I was also correct, and they were late and stuck in traffic and trying to get there, and they had to run across the street. And there's my little lion, uh, lion statue. So anybody can do it. If, if I can do it, anybody can do it. That picture doesn't show the face, but the face that was there. Was no, it was the back part. This is uh, the Temple Mount, and uh, JJ, the target that came up in Israel, was underneath the Temple Mount, and uh, and then there's a temple, a, Mus a Muslim, it's a Muslim temple above. So I kept saying there was people called to prayer, praying, and then I drew this drawing because I knew it was inside. It was a blue sign that I saw, which was this one. And then I said white light bricks and drew a brick-like structure. It doesn't show up very much in this picture right here. And um, so it's 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 a pretty nice hit. There's something there that I don't know what that was. We're looking at approximately 10 meters underground. Oh, okay, so there's no limit. <laughs> okay, so then what happened is I go back to Berkeley Lab after doing remote viewing and I uh, I give a talk on it and make a lot of enemies. And then, <laughs> and our guy is, banging on the copy machine. I'm trying to copy a physics paper and banging on it. But this is denied by the main body of physics. So I developed a physics theory that's compatible with the standard model of physics that involves psychic phenomena. And that, all right. Just leave it. If, if, if he wants to stay there and it works, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> so this is the principle of physics. And Poincaré and various means if I do experiment this week and someone does it next week in another country, we get the same results. And it has to do with Bell's theorem non-locality, which I'll talk about briefly, and remote perception, real-time per remote perception. Analyticity is how you move in the complex plane, which relates to causality. Normally, the window breaks before you throw the rock. But maybe not always, because in quantum mechanics, that's one of the paradoxes. So I developed a complex model that extends the normal space-time Minkowski-Einstein space. And then maybe unitarity conservation of energy might come in to explaining about psychokinesis. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take a vitamin C, because my throat's giving out. So. Mm. What I found is taking vitamin C for 40 years has been useful to me. But you need the zinc corgi stuff, the real vitamin C. All those rose hip things are ridiculous, mm -hmm. in my view. Elizabeth, you might mention that you had just as good success looking 9,000 miles away to Egypt or Israel from where you were as you did looking across town in Palo Alto. Absolutely. Did your chart 
there's no distant fall off. Now, viewing Alpha Centauri, since I can't get feedback um, right away, maybe after I die, if I die, see, you can also have that caveat, but it, there seems to be no attenuation. We did east-west long distance and I did north-south long distance. No difference. So there isn't a directional. So I developed a model that says, how do we get around at any instance in our world line, which is what is in physics is for space. So if I make a circle here, and I can stand up and make a circle, do I come back to the same place? But the Earth's rotated, it's gone around the sun, it's gone around the, the solar system's gone around the galaxy, so, uh, you know, it is in the same place. So, and, uh, so space time are connected. It's like uh, when I go to pizza with a friend, we specify place, 3Ds, time, and when. So that's what's called the light cone, that events are single valued that I don't bilocate. Although as a teacher fired for bilocating because her grammar school kids said there was two of her. One actually wrote on the blackboard and the other was a secondary image. And so there must be bilocation if someone got fired for it. <laughs> so I thought these issues may be solved in a court of law. So I, in general, try to be at one place at one time, and that's as best I can do right now, uh, unless of having an out-of-body experience. So at each instant, maybe I'll levitate, you know, and maybe I'll continue talking or maybe, you know, whatever, the ETs will come pick me up. But basically we travel along at each instant thinking we're making a choice. But whether you like vanilla or chocolate ice cream may be predetermined. So the real choice is a higher dimension spiritual level, I think. So how do you make a model where, like, if you have two um, cars going around the mountainside that are going to meet, but you can see from, the few, uh, from a higher dimensional perspective that these two cars are going to meet and pass each other, so you can predict their future by being in a hyperdimensional reality. The multidimensional stuff that's considered now in the standard model of physics are microscopic dimensions, but I'm using extended dimensions, ED. And so I wanted to have you, uh, I'm giving a pop quiz at the end. <laughs> you have to memorize my theory, and if you don't, I'll have it tattooed on your derriere. <laughs> Or just maybe on your wrist. I, I mean, we'll make a choice. But anyway, the whole thing is that we can actually develop an extension of four space as a complex eight space. And by accessing this eight space and the modulus, you see like the Pythagorean, th Pythagorean theorem is the square of the two sides is equal to the square of the hypotenuse, or the hypotenuse. <laughs> Hippopotamus, that's what it is. I got it. Okay, <laughs> so what happens is the modulus is real because we experience real numbers, but it's like a, an eight-dimensional Pythagorean theorem. And what happens is to have New York and Palo Alto connected by remote viewing, I have to access imaginary time. And then for precognition, I can access imaginary space. And so the mathematics works swell. And I found several other applications for it, including antenna theory designs and Hertzian and non-Hertzian ways for the engineers in the group. 
So this is an example of a diagram. That's real time, that's real space, x, y, and z. And then if I have my remote viewer uh, at SRI and, and Russell goes out to the Superdome, I can subtract off this distance by access to imaginary time. And likewise for precognition, I can subtract off the real space separation by imaginary space. And so it shows part of how we're non-locally connected. Now, where does this apply? And this is a series of papers I'm writing now, which I consider part of my landmark papers, quantum reality. And I had a cute drawing that I want to do of two smiley face electrons around a proton uh, and a neutron for uh, quantum mechanics. Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr wanted to determine this. Niels, Albert Einstein and Niels Bohr wanted to argue, I argued about whether nature is probabilistic, like the chance for something to happen you can't determine until you see it happening. That's quantum measurement. And Einstein couldn't put up with that. And of course, it related to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. I didn't meet Albert and Niels, but I did meet Warner Eisenberg. Uncertainty principle was accepted by Neil. He just was going to put up with it. And Albert came up with a paper called Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen Paradox. If the quantum mechanics is complete, then non-locality must exist. And there's a whole bunch of experiments that show no non-locality exists in physics. And a whole bunch of physicists are having a snit fit, including these two, uh, Niels and Albert, and uh, to quantum or not to quantum is what I put. But, <laughs> They look so deep in thought, it's just a lovely picture. So there's an issue in quantum mechanics. The very fundamental nature of quantum mechanics leads us to a new ball game from the classical objective out there reality. Every exists, it all exists without any thought. But what if consciousness was the universal thought? As, whereas quantum mechanics has led to all kinds of electronics, uh, you have to get the right cable, but does it resolve that? <laughs> and it leads to a wonderful paradox, which we learn new knowledge. Nature does not admit of a paradox. Paradox means a lack of knowledge. But every time you have a conundrum, solving it gives you new knowledge. It's a path to new knowledge. So the quantum paradox is quantum, uh, uh, ray, uh, wonderful discoveries. But what about if I have two particles and they're separated in space? And this guy, I measure his spin, then I know this one's spin over kilometers of distance. So the particles are doing remote viewing. OK, let me see. Uh, I'm, I'll move along. Do we live in a conscious universe? Because there's the objectivity idea, local realism is what it's called, or the non-local interaction of consciousness. So I've worked on a whole, a whole bunch of papers on Bell's theorem, the Young's double slit experiment, Super coherence in plasma, superconductivity, and remote viewing. And uh, so this one is the fact that physics leaves out this very crucial component, <coughs> mind or consciousness. And when I first talked about consciousness research at Lawrence Berkeley in the theory group, they would actually walk across the hall to get away from me because it's like they thought I had the plague. Such a terrible word to mention. But I said, who's doing the physics? They said, consciousness. 
So often we see the bits, the ions, and separateness, whereas there's a universal connection of all reality. A uh, new vision of medicine, I'll quickly talk about some research I've done for 40 years. Of course, I kind of do them at the same time, you know. But anyway, the new branch that, uh, of, of medical devices, I have a series of patents on a method of eliminating pain. And this is completely non-invasive electromagnetic. And uh, what the FDA, when we applied for FDA, IDE numbers, we got them. The operational principles and their applications as exemplified by the external non-invasive cardiac normalizer, no leads into the endocardium, external non-invasive pulsile magnetic field pain reduction device. We've had people that normally if you're in pain for two years, you there isn't any method to get back into being free of pain. And actually, I've had several accidents. I had an automobile accident. That's uh, what my current problem is. Uh, FDA clinical trials with my late husband, William Van Bice. And this is the device we're applying. Cutane Non-cutaneous. They're just electrodes that you place and hold in place by tape or an ACE bandage for about a, a 40, 20 to 40 minute treatment. We had people like uh, this particular woman was in pain for a number of years and was taking um, opiates and she became free of pain for uh, when we followed up for 14 years afterwards. Now I'll explain this in detail, but we'll probably use a couple of lifetimes to do that. But anyway, I have a whole theoretical model of how electromagnetic fields impinge and affect the endocrine system or limb system, health, skeletal structure, tendons, muscles, and it's through the Purkinje process, which exists in the endocardium and the cerebellum or the hindbrain, and they are actually a part of an I.O. system uh, where we are, are connected to our environment. So it's an I.O. input-output system. Um, this is the Fourier components of a person's healthy arm up to 500 hertz, zero to 500, a young man. This is my mom who is arthritic and her arm, and it's missing information, missing frequency components, and the bandwidth is larger to accommodate the loss of information. That's true in the cardiac system as well. So our device fills in those components. And back here, when mom had been treated with the device, then her, her arm looked more like that. And so it's a whole new revolution in medicine. This is an example of our current device. This is being applied to Mark Sherry Leg, Mark Boussier, <coughs> who's working with me now. Um, and then I'm about uh, to the conclusion that says everything is open for new knowledge. There are no unnatural or supernatural phenomena, only a very large gap in our knowledge of what is natural. We should strive to fill in these gaps. Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut. Uh, yes, we, uh, you, uh, Russell, I think I met, I think I had met Ed Mitchell through you. I'm not sure. Um, anyway, uh, if you want to read all about my theory and you have advanced degrees in mathematics, you can read this book. <laughs> uh, and then maybe you can just absorb it non-locally. <laughs> Here's how I learned general relativity. I had a shelf next to my bed, and I would meditate, pour all these books on the shelf, and then go to sleep and learn relativity, however I read the books. <laughs> Just as a backup. <laughs> One more book. One more so book. this is our new book, and it's been a wonderful pleasure and fantastic to work with my colleagues, Dr. Desiree 
and J.J. Hertak, and they are just really precious people. And I don't know what the, the word precious is probably a bit limited in nature, but that's my talk for now. And I will turn it over to these lovely people to carry forth. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, a joyous presentation. Desiree and I cover many fields. We work with Dallas Convention, we work with Gordy Cooper and um, several other astronauts who claim to have seen uh, technologies in space that were not produced by the Americans or the Russians. We've also worked behind the scenes with Andrei Kuharich, running uh, studies of the East Coast back in the 1970s. Most of this was in the black, dealing with issues of the Cold War, looking at, uh, we say, archaeological, geological, and military targets. So we're going to give a little overview of activating our consciousness body and mind in terms of the science of consciousness. And our, one of our papers has been recently published in the proceedings of the science of consciousness that took place at the University of Arizona, Tucson, last year with the Roger Penrose. And Elizabeth Rauscher and ourselves. So we feel very honored to be with you because you have this interest in the big picture of what is happening both in the area of the microcosmos as well as the macrocosmos. Right, and that's exemplified in this picture which many of you have seen in many other ways, which is where the universe and the brain looks very similar. We're seeing that the universe is really more of this filament with voids, and the brain also has these extended filaments also with you know somewhat void uh, scenarios. We're going to see this. I'm not sure how many of you have uh, been aware of what's called the Blue Brain Project. We're out of Lausanne, Switzerland since uh, 2005. They've actually done a neurotopology of the brain, and of course, most people think of it, as we just showed you, in this type of image, but now they're starting to get the geometries behind it, what's really behind this. And a lot of our work recently is on the idea of what's, what's the geometry, and Elizabeth's work is a little bit like that as well. So look at the geometries that they've actually seen in terms of the way when a one nerve gets activated to another and all the neural networks start activating, you're actually working in what they would call different dimensional realities. Now, dimensions can be simply a geometry of mathematics, but I think we're all pushing the envelope a little bit to say the dimensions are also real. And they're not just, you know, as many people say, wound up into like some sort of like inner kind of structure that these are really greater dimensional realities. So, you can so is there a training process involved with expanding consciousness and seeing these bigger geometries? And the simplex is actually a tetrahedron. And I don't know if some of you have looked at the quantum gravity research group out of Los Angeles, but they're actually saying, which works uh, some of our tech, uh, information in Egypt, that the tetrahedron, which is a simplex, is one of the key geometries of all of nature of who we are and what we are. And so this has actually also come out in the uh, work of the Blue Brain Project in Switzerland, and just some of the different geometries uh, of dimensions. So every D, for those of you who aren't the scientists, is a dimension, 3D, 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D. And they actually said could even go up to the 11th dimension, like super string theory. So we're approaching this new picture uh, from the standpoint of consciousness being the hidden variable for quantum transitions. And several of our colleagues, including uh, Carl Free Brown, uh, Basil Hiley, and others, have been looking at the concept of a quasi holographic universe as a model. It's not accepted by most, but some are looking at the possibility that our sub systems are part of a much larger system yet to be discovered. Well, mostly we're looking at the fact that our, is our three-dimensional reality coming out of a two-dimensional reality? That's what people are, starting, are looking at. But we would say, and this is also what Elizabeth Rauscher says, is, and actually this is research also done by Russell Targ, who will be with us hopefully in the question and answer period, which we will have at the end of the session, that the eighth dimension is important. And so you can actually get, and some scientists have theoretically talked about this, the eighth dimension 
uh, actually is more the predominant, or we'll say the preliminary, the, the real reality where all space and time kind of converge. And then out of that comes like four-dimensional, what's even called quasi-crystals, coming down into this reality. So we're really more of a projection from an eighth-dimensional reality. And this really ties into the mathematics that both Elizabeth Rauscher and... and so four have. real and four imaginary. So, but are we in a holographic universe where each part is part of every part? Well, in that sense, yes. In the part of the fact that we're uh, coming out of a two-dimensional universe, that we would say is wrong. But, of course, you've all seen Interstellar, the movie. And, I mean, that reality is a possibility. And that there could be information coming to us here from the fifth or sixth dimension. I'm sure everyone in this room has seen that movie, I'm sure, right? Because it's definitely working. So this is part of that uh, Tesseract. We, we even have video games on the <laughs> Tesseract speaking with the four-dimensional cube. The ability to see certain curvature combinations that normally would not be visible to our optical system. But, you know, that these other dimensions bleed in or can in some way feed us information, geometries, and other realities. And it, maybe even our brain is picking up on that. So. Well, this does great design this, and it's interesting how long it took for color to come into physics. Neuroscientist uh, during California, at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Michael Gosman, uh, believes that we will not get over the idea of free will and accept that we are a special kind of machine, one with a moral agency which comes from living in social groups. So is that true? I'll ask the audience. Are we a machine? Are we just processing information? Can they determine everything we think of? Yes? No? Ooh. No, right, exactly. So Good. we're more than a <laughs> computer. Uh, and, and this uh, has been entertained by these three very illustrious speakers. Well, we would say the biocomputer idea, and this is interesting. I mean, I love Elon Musk. I think he's like one of my idols. And of course, Brian Greene is amazing. He's done the whole preliminary on super strings. And here's Neil deGrasse Tyson, and we spend some of our time in New York. He's actually head of the, uh, uh, one of the observatory astrophysics museums there, uh, director of the Hayden Planetarium in New York. They're all talking about a simulated universe. How many people have heard about this term? Okay, so pretty good. So are we living in a simulated universe? We would actually say no, because a simulation means that we're not real. And uh, when you listen to some of Brian Greene's and Neil deGrasse Tyson's, they said, well, it's just as easy to create, uh, it's easier to create a simulated world than a real world. But we don't think that's true. We think it's just as easy to also create a real world. So it doesn't mean that we're not linked, like a simulated universe, to other dimensional realities, because this is what Elizabeth's talking about on her eighth space. She didn't get into it too detailly here. But the eighth space would be like that, really, where space and time, where all of time exists. And she would even tell you, and you can ask her the question, that when we want to um, change reality, when we want to get beyond the mechanistic reality of who we are, we actually function into the eighth space to change the predetermination of life. And Russell's worked a lot with precognition. Well, you know, is, if you have precognition all the time, well, is there free will? Is there change, uh, ways to change that reality? And the answer would be yes, when you can work with these other uh, dimensional And scenarios. this feeds into so many different directions. Really, we're at a new frontier of expanded consciousness. Although... There are others that <laughs> are interested more in the singularity of, of the super robot. And we see here David Hansen's uh, Sophia 3 <laughs> standing right next to Desiree. We had an opportunity to talk to her and ask her... I say she has better skin than I What do. is the meaning of love? <laughs> and she could not define the meaning of love. <laughs> this sort of shocked some of the scientists in the community. Uh, to my right as I stand before the picture are two scientists from uh, Australia who are interested and, and of course next to Sophia is the famous journalist uh, Ellen Steinfeld from New York City. All of us were rather intrigued by the beauty of her yeah. face. Elizabeth was with us, she was taking and the Of course picture. the Chinese are doing a lot with uh, <laughs> facial recognition now in terms of determining the psyche and the social dimension. But At the same time it's quite interesting how many will want to go to the robotization of our future rather than realizing the power of the mind, the, the hidden power of the human psyche that we're beginning to see has great value. Right, and this was all at the Science of Consciousness uh, conference. Deepak Chopra was there and was actually trying to meditate with uh, the Sophia, but uh, in actuality it doesn't really come off the same. And really what 
is the difference? And I think this is something everyone in Silicon Valley needs to know or to ask themselves or to find their own answers if they want, is what is the difference between a robot who really can even think better than us in some cases, uh, I can't wait for my driverless car, but anyway. The and, ancient Greeks and Romans and uh, had this concept us. of Sophia, the female principle. Yeah. Wisdom, it means wisdom. There was a connection with the divine or universal mind, and of course, Cesare and I put out a book, a five volume study of the Sophia heritage, and of course, we were rather shocked that Sophia should play this role of robot yeah. when historically she was anything but a robot. <laughs> But anyway, but the idea is we have this deeper consciousness. We have this ability for precognition to tapping into the eight dimensional space to really knowing more. There is, if we're interconnected, we actually have all the information we need. That's what remote viewing shows us. We can see what's going on somewhere else. Uh, Russell has a great film coming out called Third Eye Spies. It's amazing what these guys saw and did and it really shocked, we'll say, the CIA and the NSA because these are undercover situations that they could see and do. And we're not telling you to go do that, but you know, you can use it in a very practical way when you need to find your keys, for example. We have a friend that's a great remote viewer. You call him up, he knows exactly where your keys are. Solves the problem of life. I'm just saying that <laughs> this is one aspect. We are biotransducers, that is, we are senders and receivers of thoughts and signals that produce thoughts within us based on our desires or our mindfulness. So this is the idea. We able to grasp a new reality. We recognize that we, we are a body, but we are also more than a body. Right, and so uh, we're familiar with Russell Targ. This is the book that Dr. Ingle Swan illustrated beautifully on the cover, and here we see the concept of the egg of the universe, Brahma Agni, in the Sanskrit tradition, but also, if you look very carefully, you see a whirling galaxy within the egg of the mind or our perceptual apparatus can see into the future, can see that we're part of a whirling galaxy of infinite possibilities. And of course, there below our picture is the work of the late Pat Price looking at a Russian facility, Semipolitensk, where he was able to diagnose the underground facilities with the huge attractor rails that, that later were confirmed with great accuracy. Right, during the Cold War, I mean, look at the exact one is the drawing of Pat Price, the other is the reality of what was there. I mean, there's almost no difference. I mean, Pat Price can get numbers. In fact, uh, it's amazing. He could see everything if he needed to see anything. The importance of this book, however, was to emphasize also the work of the great uh, Buddhist scholar, Nagarjuna. He was called also the second Buddha by the Dalai Lama, and his brilliance to see that there's something more than th uh, four-point logic. Right, and this is one of the pictures from uh, Mind Dynamics that uh, Elizabeth let us Part of our series of show. experiments in Egypt and Israel we did some time ago. Here I am with a group of scholars. We're walking into a major auditorium at the University of Cairo. Note the strange... Uh, lamppost. Uh, lamppost. Note also the color of the door that's opened. Note the number of men that are walking. And look at Elizabeth's uh, sketch pad. Uh, 9,000 uh, miles away. She even said like that there's this cobalt blue. Well, actually, if you can see, this, is, this door is very interesting. It actually is a blue metal door. It's a very unusual door. But look at the embellishments that. around the globe at the top and the embellishments at the bottom matching exactly. So that's now, all of these yeah. studies were done. We had military security. These were situations this is Egypt of touch and go. We were on front lines, and I won't go into details, but we worked behind the scenes in many countries where it's best to work through the power of the mind. So, so her contact with us, again, followed her training at SRI. Her sketchbook, as you can see right there, is illustrating one of many targets that she was able to precisely see in great detail. So Above ground, <laughs> underground under military control situations, on open space situations. So as Elizabeth showed you many familiar areas of Palo Alto and the region around here, we're talking, of course, about Russia and Egypt. But we have Ingo Swan, who uh, Russell was a key part of this work. He remote viewed Jupiter. Now that's far away. Ingo Swan remote viewed <laughs> right? Jupiter, our sister <laughs> planet, so to speak, to see ice crystals in the atmosphere in a ring which were later confirmed. Harold Pudoff, Russell Targ, and others were immensely important as principals in this research. The formal report was entitled Swan's Remote Viewing Probe of Jupiter. Of course, 
Harold Sherman, a mutual friend, was also indirectly involved here, but we're interested in looking at the drawings that Ingo made with great precision. So you can see the crystal ice that he felt was around the atmosphere. You can see like almost kind of a ring. Now, no one knew this. This is really in, as we see, 1973 in April. So this is an amazing uh, set of information. Here's some of the mathematics, uh, I mean, exactly the times and what he said. Let's Just a brief statement. I hope it's Jupiter, I think that it must have an extremely large hydrogen mantle. If a space probe made contact with that, it would be maybe 80,000 to 120,000 miles out from the planet's surface. Another entry. Very light in the atmosphere, there are crystals there. Glitter, maybe the stripes are like bands of crystals, maybe like rings of Saturn. Though not far out like that, very close within the atmosphere. I bet you they reflect radio probes. Is that possible if you had a cloud of crystals that were salted by different radio waves? And, and of course, Hell says that's, that's right. And then it goes on also to the idea of cloud layers and uh, seeing different colors, which also... So later on, just uh, shortly, some that year, some many years later, uh, Scientific American confirmed this. So remember that was April 73, September 73. Above the hypothesis hypothetical core is a thick stratum in which hydrogen is by far the most abundant element. This is what uh, Swan saw. Uh, farther down, maybe in, in September 74, Science News says farther down may be frozen water crystals and possibly even liquid water, the pioneer researchers suggest, although water has never been observed there. This is Pioneer, uh, one of the sh uh, satellites going out. And so then the Voyager, scientific confirmations are abundant. And again, uh, uh, Russell's work with Ingo and uh, Elizabeth's work also with the team at SRI has really raised the bar to a very high level of accuracy. So again, Voyager also confirmed all these data bits that happened afterwards, confirmed everything that Ingo had seen on the surrounding uh, planet. Again, this is a double plus, a triple plus for the concept of non-locality, and of course Henry Stapp at UC Berkeley said the finding and verification of non-locality is the greatest thing that happened since the finding of relativity. So we're at a, a benchmark, so to speak, in terms of understanding what is consciousness, capital C. Is it simply the flow of sodium ions through our brain circuitry, or is it something larger in terms of the whole reflective nature? of human as being a part of a cosmophysical universe. So we see this picture once again, but now we're starting to understand it more deeply. Consciousness is non-physical in the sense of classical physics, since it's working with the observer at the quantum level, but it's also entangled with the brain. So for those people who think that consciousness resides in the brain, then I direct you to other wisdom and research going on now, Stuart Hameroff, Roger Penrose, many others, that really see consciousness as that field. And I think all of you are familiar with this concept, but what you need to do is apply the concept. I think that's the key, because we don't apply it. We know it, but we don't use it. So next time you lose your keys, let, next time you want to know where your child is or where your, how your mother's doing or whatever you want to know, you know, use a little bit of your own higher consciousness to make that breakthrough. In the and Chinese traditions of the East, we have the wonderful traditions of geometry and interlocking boxes. We try to illustrate this here on the left of the presentation. Here, the brain creates a tuning with the consciousness field, which is a non-local control process, which steers the information by adjusting the probabilities of the interpenetrated possibilities for superpositions. And so one uh, geometric structure is placed upon another, they are integrated through so, the expansion of consciousness. Right, so all the possibilities are there, you know, like the cat's alive or the cat's dead, but in actuality, when your consciousness becomes attuned, it starts to become the observer to actually see and know. And how do we receive this information? Well, there's many ways in our body that we do receive this information. One of the things uniquely, as we mentioned, the tetrahedron is important. We actually have pyramidal it's really pyramidal, but they won't say that word. Parental uh, neurons. Parental <laughs> neurons. This work was done at UC Irvine with Thompson, Professor Thompson, who I was studying when I was there at the university. Parental neurons are our principal output neurons composing approximately 80% of neurons in the cortex region. Parental cells act as electrocrystal cells and seem to operate 
in the fashion of a liquid crystal oscillator, plural oscillators, in response to different light commands or light pulses. So you basically have a kind of radio antenna in your head. Actually, it was interesting when Andrea Puhart first did his experiment, this guy was getting information he was working with. It was one of his, uh, his clients. And he realized, actually, there was some sort of uh, something in his filling of his tooth that was giving him radio signals. But it just shows you how sensitive we are to uh, information that goes on around us. Peter Garayev at the University of Moscow and his group have shown quasi-crystal properties for human DNA, which seems to be able to process holographic information in conjunction with solenoids. So actually, yeah, the DNA in our own system, we feel, is also sensitive. And that could be why, in some sense, consciousness affects your body that then affects your DNA, causing, we'll say, you know, miscommunication uh, with cells, um, some of that. We're going to be seeing some of the situation with, like, what happens with cancer cells. So consciousness also is a key to that. That's why positive thinking so we're, is you important. Just go back a second. Okay. We're like a living membrane between the micro and the macro. We see the, the macro of what's happening in the greater universe surrounding us through uh, the fuel telescope, the Hubble Fuel Telescope, and we see on the micro level what the Russians were studying, a similar geometric form. But we feel the ancients knew this. This is an ancient picture from Egypt. And so here is, of course, the, the horse, the god figure, giving information, we would say, or flowers. But what's flowers, really, mm -hmm. if not kind no, the, of the Egyptians of also information. considered the flower in terms of the lotus. The lotus for the Orientals as well as for the Egyptians was a sign of higher communication and enlightenment. The five levels or, shall we say, emanations of the lotus petal represents the higher language of light. And this is pointed out in some detail in our new book entitled Giza's Industrial Complex, where we in, uh, cover 40 years of research. <coughs> Elizabeth has a copy of the book, and she wrote a little um, recommendation, recommendation for, for the yeah. book. It just came out. We have uh, had to keep all of this information sub rosa for 40 years because the Egyptian authorities were rather disturbed that we came across a treasure trove of hieroglyphic patterns and information that suggests that there was another aspect to a pre-Egyptian side of knowledge. So what are we really? Well, on the highest level, we have a consciousness linkage with quantum mind and mind too. We would say the consciousness field. Then we have a network in our system, which is kind of the holistic body that's connected with the biofeedback centers of the body. And acupuncture science is one of the oldest systematic feedback systems in the world, going back some eight to 10,000 years. And then we also have a biochemical brain process, as we showed you from the Blue Brain Project. It's not only light and chemistry, but works together with the pyramidal cells to create it like a kind of circuitry that then functions and gives us thoughts and ideas that we can process in our body. All these actually feed us information, but then of course it takes the processing from the brain into our reality. And then we have the biochemical laboratory body, which is connected with the epikinetic, which according to um, our friend Bruce, Lipton? Lipton is uh, important because the epigenetic is connected with the epikinetic in terms of the vibration of the chromosomal process. And then as Elizabeth showed you, the electromagnetic body. We're going to show you some of that electromagnetic body in a few minutes. But first, I just want to say, uh, Russell, I always love his remote viewing uh, sessions and classes because he puts something underneath a cloth and says, what is this a draw it? But I'm going to just do it more electronically because we're in the 20, you know, and a different thing. So on the next screen, there's a number from one to nine. Can you think of what that number is? Just and as Russell would say in any of his talks, you know, it's the first thing that pops into your mind. So we're going to just give you about 10 seconds to have that first thing that pops into your mind. The first number. <laughs> it's one number from one to nine. I'm going to kind of project it. Elizabeth, you project it as well. You know what that number is. And just see if you get it. I mean, it, it's more difficult in this capacity than if I had something underneath a cloth. But OK, here we go. Eight. If you got it, yeah, some people got it. If you had, you, you got it. Okay, great. See, it all happens. So, you know, you have that ability. Even if you saw circles, the circles work too. I, I said one and nine, so you shouldn't have had a zero, but you never know. You could have just seen that. So that's really who we are. 
And we have to live it. We have to become it. We have to use it all the time. So and this is the new image of humanity, the Vitruvian man, a woman reaching out in all directions, realizing that life and the divine is a verb. The divine, I shall be what I shall be, is imprinted within the human mind. We are in the quest. The ancients used in Egypt, as well as the indigenous cultures of the world, the, the bird symbol, particularly the, the dove as a sign of communication with the divine, as well as the sign of peace. The La Paloma is a symbol, of course, we find many of the indigenous ceremonies, and I had the opportunity to work with the indigenous tribes in Brazil. I represent 15 of their tribes at the United Nations. They have looked into the future, like the Iroquois tribes, four generations into the future. And they claim that Mother Earth is crying. We are coming to the end of a cycle. Some will not understand, others will. But we are presently dancing on the edge of extinction. But don't forget that we actually have insights. And whether you believe it's from some other beings or just from the consciousness field itself, it can direct you, it can guide you, it can give you insights. And that's the important thing to realize. So, uh, and also, more importantly, let's consider the idea of positive thoughts of love and gratitude. And I'm sure everyone in this room knows about uh, Dr. Dr. Moto exemplifies work. this using thoughts that are very productive, using music that is very harmonious. And why not to be negative? It, because things are happening and people are going to get more and more negative. I'm sure we're all feeling that kind of energy. I can't even believe it's 2019. That's enough to be negative about. <laughs> but in actuality, we have to have the positive input because we're actually putting input back into the consciousness field. So if we're going to put negative energy into the consciousness field, we're just feeding that energy in the field. Here was some of the research published in the Journal of Alternative and Complementary Medicine for the year 2004, showing different examples of water crystals. So don't forget your body is like 70... 5% water. So this is what have we seen here? Right, I just want to show you in terms of the thoughts or the energies of water. First of all, this is from Lourdes, France. And uh, the next one, the top right, is actually from heavy metal music. So if you're listening to heavy metal music, I mean, this is, could be what part of the cells of your body are looking like, you know. Or if you have ideas of love and thanks, you can be looking instead like this. This is a vial wrapped with the word devil. So just having a vial wrapped with the word devil, it looks, the water looks like this. Or love spilled backwards. And Dr. Hertak really likes classical music, and so I guess did Emoto. But I mean, it, this is really just testing. This is what he showed in testing. And this is the Schmetna, the Moldo, beautiful classical music, very mellow, very warming for the water, if I can put it that way. We invited Emoto to the United Nations. He spoke there and was a great hit. But the importance of his work was to excite young people who are not perhaps in the mainstream of science, but are in areas of art, in philosophy, or interested in how consciousness can work in new creative ways. So we have to understand our interconnectedness and where we become aware of people and their own perceptions as well and cease to focus only on our own point of view and also on our own reality. We have to see ourselves, it's a Buddhist technique as well, or Sanskrit as well, you know, stepping out of ourselves, seeing ourselves as interconnected with others, understanding where they're coming from. You may not agree with it, you may not, you know, but you need to see where they're coming from. You need to be part of their consciousness field, even temporarily, to have a greater understanding. So like uh, Elizabeth closed with her ideas of of energy and health and healing. We want to show that all life is vibration. I'm going to speed this up for just a minute. And uh, we know that the frequencies affect the body, electromagnetic fields that come from wireless devices. I wish Beverly uh, Rubick was here. And, uh, and cell phones can affect your DNA. Sadly, if they would concentrate and be aware of this or really work towards this, we actually could hold up cell phones that would heal our bodies. But right now we're holding up cell phones that don't heal our bodies. And so, but the right frequencies can, can heal your body. That's These so important. These archetypal forms are what we call cosmograms, showing the mind how the left and right hemispheres can be coordinated, and complementary. And the whole vibration exists all around us. I mean, wherever you are, you have brain rhythms, you have heart it's, muscles, you have eyes, you have urban noise. called mains or all of the connecting routes brought together. 
So everything is vibration. Everything is affecting us. We, we talked about remote viewing, which is really the thoughts, the mental field from consciousness. But our body also is exposed on a continual basis to vibration. We can use this in a positive way. Again, sound healing, frequency medicine is just beginning to be understood. All energy, including those in atoms and molecules and in turn cells, are electromagnetic in nature. And that is why they produce electromagnetic fields that really can be used also to heal. We're just going to show you a few things that have come out recently to help uh, in terms of the healing process. Here's interesting. This is a magnosphere out of a Florida company that uses magnetic resonance ther therapy to heal and help. There's others that are pulse electromagnetic fields that the government actually has even worked on in some capacity. Uh, this is ultrasound. So ultrasound is being used. Uh, the zethral system, as it is called, using ultrasonic devices, or shall we say preparing and repairing the body to work under situations of normal business habits. But more importantly, and probably more advanced than any of these, because all those are kind of things you can buy and put on yourself, is this, which is called tumor treating fields. That's come out recently, at, well, from 2000 in Israel by a man named Yoram Alti. He's a he, and professor emeritus of physiology and biophysics at Technion, the Israel's Institute of Technology. And you can do more research on this at, at NovoCure. It's actually even a, uh, it's a corporation that you can have stock in. And they have been the only one successful in being able to keep people alive with glioblastoma, a very which is brain cancer. Breakthrough it's amazing. in the most deadly forms of cancer. And they have FDA approval for glioblastoma to be able to use this and you can see that they make it as like a type of cap for, for someone to wear and basically uh, it's a place transducers attached to a field generator to create an artificial electric field to act on the proteins within the nucleus of the cells that literally stops the cell division so they don't claim cure because you'd have to get rid of every single cancer cell in your body to claim cure, but they stop the divisions. And if you stop the divisions, basically, you're able to continue to live. And it's amazing. As you know, with the uh, problem of Basama, you will have a very short time of life. But they've been able to work now with clients that have been, shall we say, repaired for upwards of five, six, seven years. And even though it came out of Israel, though, there's been research at the Wake Forest Medical Center in North Carolina. This is the actual paper and the US people that are working on it. Uh, so you can make a note of that or we can show it later. Just want to say, because frequencies are always so important, the study identified a total of 1,524 frequencies ranging from 0.1 hertz to 114 kilohertz. Most frequencies, 57 and 92, were specific for a single tumor site. So they're, but they're using more than one frequency. That's the difference between what this is and the Rife devices and some of the others, although Elizabeth's device is also incredible, but that's for pain. But you, literally, you have such frequencies that are combined together. And that seems to be the key. That's why a lot of the, uh, we'll say, the smaller devices were not able to do it. They're also looking for breast cancer, um, other carcinomas, prostate cancer, and pancreatic. But they do have the FDA approval on glioblastoma because no one's been able to keep these people alive. So the tumor types cover the whole gamut, from brain tumors to prostate to do ovarian to pancreatic cancer. And here's the number of frequencies used, actually. So it's quite a few. Anyway, amazing technology. We don't have too much time because we want to get We're into questions. We're holding the world in our hands. A new generation of humanity has wonderful breakthroughs. We have to go beyond what I will call a culture of death that is preached to us through the media, constantly giving us scenarios of death and crime. We have to be able to push forth with the power of the psyche, what the ancients would call the higher mind or spirit that sees life beyond life and the possibility of rejuvenation. And we have to reach within to find that still small voice, I often say. That really will tell you where to be and if you listen to it and you, you test it, you can test it, you know, you, let's see, am I getting something saying I need to be here or not? And, and work with it. It actually really comes together. So Beyond the circuitry of our body and mind, we enter the higher dimensions of thought form creativity and, and operate as one with the eternal mind of the I am. That's from the Keys of Enoch, Dr. Herzog's book. Which is a paraphysical text of experiences of contact that I shared many years ago with uh, colleagues and friends and shamanistic leaders in South America. So our artists with the Academy have put together a series of pictures or cosmograms, one of which is here, showing the different 
planes or levels of consciousness. As we see ourselves at the bottom as earth dwellers, we see this potential through the language of color, sacred geometry and sound, to open up, as it were, other learning channels or levels of experience. Ultimately, we see that we are a rainbow body, or what in the traditions of the Sanskrit and Tibetan literature of the East is the jewel vehicle, and ultimately, in the fuller sense of all of the great mystical traditions of the world religions, we see the higher self or the over-self that is, is the divine human partnership. So Teher de Chardin talked about this as the new sphere, and here we're expanding this knowledge of the universal wisdom and knowledge that is everywhere. Universal intelligence is everywhere, and whether we go to Jupiter or whether we go into the eighth dimensional reality, basically all information is at our fingertips. In a certain sense, we've been limited. We don't know who we truly are, and this is now changing, we believe, with both uh, quantum physics as well as consciousness. It calls science. forth a new language of pictographic cybernetics. If thoughts become things, choose the good ones. <laughs> and here we and have the panorama of the uh, sister planets that yeah, we're exploring, yeah, okay. life beyond life, exoplanets, but more importantly, according to Gordon Cooper and others that we've privately talked to, we're beginning to realize that we're part of a cosmic family. So we're going to play a five-minute uh, clip from our movie, Gates of Light, but we just want to close with one conclusion first. Be the light, be the love, meditate, as Elizabeth said, and vibrate the power of the divine within you. And let us look for one minute at this. Uh, if, can we get the lights down for just a few moments at all? Okay, to get a little bit more. This will be just about three minutes. <laughs> Visualize the multi-dimensions, the vastness of Mother Earth that we're all part of. The understanding of the higher meaning of the ancient pyramids and temples is representing a type of acoustical physics to center the mind, to expand the mind, to give altered states of creativity. The image of the burden, the image of man, the woman in the bird represents ascension, the ability to entertain other planes of creativity. We begin to realize that we are part of a co-evolutionary process within and without. We begin to understand the symbols that we find within ourselves. And the network of life which we are a part of. It See creates our... the Mandela of life, the ongoing spark of creativity. We've looked to nature to find our identity, but we also need to look to the heavenly realms. To find the inner compassion, which the ancients also called the feminine principle of co-creation. Whether upon the statues in India, or Indonesia, China, or the Middle East, we see the image of creation with the multi levels of the star kingdoms. As we open up the power of the inner vision, some would call the third eye, others the dual eye, we begin to see that we're constantly creating constantly expanding in this network. So let us go through the vortex, say the white hole, or the wormhole. Let us feel the joy of expansion, that we are the capstone upon the pyramids of antiquity. We are the discoverers of the new world realization that as much space is within us that we are in space humbles us to the vastness of a much larger planet of creation called the higher evolution. And the ancients understood this when they built their temples. They acknowledged the other powers of creation. of light, a realm of interconnectedness, of oneness. The indigenous people have told us 
about the sacred geometry. And now we understand that they are also the codes to the universe. They've also told us about Mother Earth. It must be found once again at the return of the star nations. And thus, we open up the inner mind the power of the third eye, the power of the cosmic vision that calls us into co-creation, that connects the infinite speciehood with the infinite way, with the infinite mind, in a continuous process of exploration, creation, and wisdom fulfillment. As we find the use of sacred geometry and color, we begin to understand also in the mystical traditions of the Near East, the Kabbalistic tradition, how we are, in essence, are the tree of life, with the many branches now reaching into the wisdom of the greater universe, called the house of many mansions. The many worlds, the many universes, the many opportunities, all is part of this vast blueprint that we are beginning to recognize is part of our future. May the spark of consciousness and co-creativity be with us as we open up the lotus of our own life and realize the compassion and the love and the wisdom that unites us with all people and all traditions of the light. So be it. We thank you. So we have... We always love to save time, uh, some t time for uh, questions. And uh, Russell, will you join us on some of that if they are on uh, remote viewing and science? I do want to say before you go, we have the table in the back yeah, with some of the music that we did with Alice Coltrane, we did with uh, Jocelyn and Smith. And the books, uh, Some a of the books. great musicians and artists in the world that we've worked with over the last 40 years. And we have our new book on Egypt that deals with all right, but we ask you not to go because we ended early to be able to do questions and answers from all of you. It deals with or the just finding talk of together. salt water batteries that we found in the archives underneath yeah. the pyramidal complex. That's not available yet, but uh, it will be in Those the of you who are engineers will understand the significance of this find. You so will explain how the Egyptians were able to light up their underground passageways and tunnels. This information was literally kept under wraps for 40 years. Like the children of Israel in the desert for 40 years. We've come out with it now after 40 years. We can't wait any longer. People have to know what is happening in the Middle East and the archive of information that's going to come out publicly, which may find many religionists changing their tune and understanding a greater plan of science that was there to begin with. So can we have some questions, some comments? Come on, this is a... It uh, will be available will in be. about three weeks. Yeah, three weeks. Three yeah. weeks. Yeah, Keys of Enoch is our website. Actually, Keys of Enoch. Uh, okay, so some questions. Come on. Okay, so we'll start over here. So, in the remote viewing experiments you were talking about, there was a there was two people. Unlike what you're talking about, I think with Russia, but I could be wrong there. And here's what confuses me: How do you know that the remote viewing was that it was a person seeing a place, not a person connecting to another person and seeing through their eyes. Could I answer that? Yeah. Um, what I found is sometimes the remote viewer will see things at the site that I didn't see. There was a whole creek and trees beside the uh, Macy's department store that I didn't see that was pointed out when I took the remote viewer with Russell for feedback, Ella Hammett. So she had seen things I couldn't see. And in the case of the Superdome, um, Russell couldn't go inside, but the viewer could go inside. And sometimes abstract targets that are not geographical and don't have an outbound person. I've had targets sealed in uh, light kite containers that are accurately remote viewed. So, yeah, I'll, I'll repeat it actually. So, 
Um, so the question was, how do you know it's remote viewing and not just telepathy? Like, in other words, she's not going to the site. She's just reading like Elizabeth's uh, mind. Uh, yes. Yeah. We were working for two decades for the CIA. We were not trying to prove. <laughs> the CIA was not trying to prove mental telepathy. We would have tasks to do like uh, a Russian plane has crashed in Africa. Nobody knows where it is. The satellites cannot penetrate the jungle. Can you find the downed Russian airplane? So we found a, one of our experienced viewers. We gave her a map of northern Africa. She did a meditation, drew a circle. She says, between the river and the mountain, within that circle, the CIA then launched a helicopter, landed in the circle, and as they landed in the circle, natives were pulling pieces of the airplane out of the river. So there's no mental telepathy available. The person had to have a direct mental experience of where the thing was presently. Great. So in, the, in these cases, it's not like uh, you're going to the location. It's more like there's no separation. This is, what we're talking about regarding remote viewing is not new age. The Buddhists wrote about this extensively 2,500 years before Christ. And if you read the Buddhist writings in the Prajnaparamita, the Buddhist is saying there's no separation in consciousness. Separation is an illusion. And that's really in agreement with the model that Elizabeth described. As we live in a four space here, that is the room is made of three dimensions and there's a time dimension, and that's what we normally experience. But in uh, psychic functioning, what we notice is that you're able to move through that space and experience things that are far away. So the result of the eight space metric, four real dimensions and four imaginary dimensions, that gives you an eight space metric. So space time, like the space time you see here, except four of the dimensions are real, four of them are imaginary, and we call that a metric. So the thing that's unusual about this metric is there will always be a path from you to some distant point where the s total distance is zero. That is, the, in the complex domain, the x squared plus y squared between you and the distant points x squared plus y squared equals zero. And that's because some of the x's and some of the y's are negative or imaginary, and they add to zero. So you're really not having to go from here to there. Elizabeth didn't have to go from Palo Alto to Egypt. She quieted her mind and experienced the aspect of Egypt that was already with her. Similarly, when Ingo was describing the rings around Jupiter, Jupiter is 500 million miles away. It's like a, it takes light an hour to get from Jupiter here. But when the NASA asked him, is there anything unusual we'll find in Jupiter, Ingo took a couple of puffs on his cigar and said, by golly, there are big fat rings around Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And that was verified a year and a half later when the Pioneer finally got there. Ingo got there instantaneously because in the eight-dimensional space-time, he doesn't have to go there because there's no distance for consciousness. So the most interesting thing that I can tell you, the most interesting thing we learned in our two decades of work, is one of them is that increasing the distance doesn't matter. It's no harder to describe what's going on in Soviet Russia than it is to describe what's going on at Stanford. The fact that Russia is 8,000 miles away and Stanford is across the street, the accuracy of our descriptions of a weapons factory in Soviet Siberia was just as good as describing Macy's. No degradation at all for increasing the distance. And I will sit down in a moment, but the most interesting thing that I know 
in my lifetime, the most interesting thing that I know I can share with you, and that is, it's no harder to describe days or weeks in the future than it is to describe something contemporaneous. So that when we wanted to forecast change in the silver commodity market, describing things that were happening a week in the future, we did that perfectly. Each week for nine weeks, we forecast whether the market go up a little or down a little, up a lot or down a lot, and we were correct <coughs> nine weeks in a row, and we are on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. So the idea that your consciousness can move through space-time is really better understood by saying that there's no distance. You don't have to go to Russia, you don't have to go to China. That information is available in a non-local sense. As Henry Stapp said, the most remarkable discovery in all of physics is the discovery of non-locality. The idea of non-locality is that when two, po po when two particles are created at the same time, they can be at opposite ends of the universe, and if you grab one of them, the other one is affected. So the idea is that your consciousness has available to it events and objects distant from you, both in space and in time, and that's available to all of you. I was gonna say the University of uh, Colorado did a similar experiment with the stock market and also had 100%. It's not just one guy, though, I have to say. You had a team. How many people gave you information? You, you had one guy? I worked with one, one viewer. One guy. Okay, and in uh, Colorado, I think they had about five, and they took the average of it, but they were also 100% correct of predicting the stock market in the future. So Bill has a question. Actually, I just wanted to add uh, something on Ingo Swan's work. In 1998, he published a book called Penetration. He was quite surprised that he got a call from somebody he knew in the middle of the night telling him that in two weeks he would get another call from somebody within the government that um, there was no paper trail for. But the person he knew said, it's my uh, belief you're safe to work with these people. Two weeks went by, he didn't get a call. <clears throat> but another couple of weeks went by and he got the call. He got it about three in the morning. It was in those days, <clears throat> around 74, I think. Um, there was no message machines and all that, so he had to answer the phone. They asked him to come to New York and go through a series of protocols to meet with these people that were aware that he had remote viewed Jupiter. And he was quite shocked with SRI's security that they even knew that he had done this. And ultimately, they told him they wanted him to remote view the dark side of the moon because of extraterrestrial bases that were there. <laughs> and so I encourage all of you to look at penetration. It is incredibly fascinating. And this is information that was from the 70s. He said he was told he had to wait 20 years before he could publish. The book, when I looked it up, was going on the internet for about $500 at the time. It was very hard to find. I found a brand new copy in a used bookstore for $6.94, $7. I don't figure, think that was an accident. But my point is, Ingo tells it in great detail all the way to meeting an extraterrestrial woman in Los Angeles and working with people like Russell and um, others. It's just absolutely fascinating. Penetration. Thank you. Thank you. I will say the bottom line to all of the work at Stanford Research Institute was to show there's no such thing as private or hidden knowledge. Everything is available. It's when Russell spoke in the former Soviet Union to a prestigious group of scientists and engineers and said, essentially that, there is no such thing as hidden or secret knowledge. According to what Russell said, you could hear a pin drop in the audience. <laughs> he shocked the Russians, and they knew the game, so to speak, was up in the sense that everything is available on some wavelength. And the Russians were very shocked with the idea that there's no secrecy anymore. I was in Russia. Bring you over, maybe? 
giving that talk, I guess, in 1984, where everything was a secret. Ten minutes. Okay. Oh, okay. It's okay. It's dry. It's fine. So, Elizabeth, some feedback on uh, no private information? You have to tell the truth. <laughs> yeah, the theme, theme of our film, the way I say numerous times, is that there are no secrets anymore. So I wanted to make a film with the CIA contract monitors in the film on screen saying we were polygraphed, we saw what Targ did, and it was really true what he said because we were there. So it was really the presence of the CIA in our film that makes it an event rather than just another psychic movie. Yeah, this is a new film that, Russell, you'll be coming out with in the next uh, month. month. It's called Third Eye Spies. I think you've uh, talked here, maybe talking about it, but it's uh, really a great wrap-up for the, all the work that was done in the 70s. Even Gene Roddenberry recognizes Russ's work, a great maestro in terms of science, film writing, and going into space. He recognized future science before it happened. Science guided by consciousness, we define as future science. So let's take another question. Um, what happens if a government doesn't want to have you see something? Can you can they can the government energetically put like a cloak of energy? <laughs> can I just say, actually, interesting that Uri Geller, who also was tested at SRI, uh, worked for the uh, Mexican government and the, uh, probably the U.S. as well, but he doesn't say that to spy on what was in a briefcase of a Russian agent. So I think, no, I think, you know, this information is available as far as I'm concerned. And you just have to have the right person who can see it and know it. And that's where the shocking thing is. I mean, do you think that there's any way of blocking remote viewing? Blocking remote viewing? Well, hmm. I knew a very important person that I won't name who had more honorary degrees than anybody else on the planet. I think it was 50 honorary PhDs. And we would talk about psychic phenomena, which was verboten at Lawrence Berkeley. And it was like he had a black screen pulled down. Because when I was working with another co-author, uh, especially since I was a junior member, he would be asking questions. So I read his mind because he was trying to communicate with me ahead of time, so I had a ready answer. <laughs> and so, uh, and then I did things like this. I would go up to a person and say, oh, you have a black and white spotted dog. And the guy would think I had seen him with his dog and described the dog as to what I viewed. I tried that even as a kid going up to people and trying to know their name. I would say the statistics were a little rough on that. So you would say you could, that the people sometimes can try to block it, but in a sense you're trying to talk about a consciousness field, the information's already in There's the field. There's too much stress to block your yeah. thoughts. It's yeah. just, it's a drag hook. Early I mean, in our program, Pat Price was asked to describe something in Virginia, and what he zeroed in on is a NSA listening post called Sugar Grove. It was one of the most secret things in America it was a huge microwave listening post used to listen in on uh, Soviet microwave activities. I don't have to go in further. And it, but it was a ultra crypto secret thing and, and Pat described it and then went into the lower levels and read off the code names of the various programs that were going on there. <laughs> and all hell broke loose. The NSA was furious with the CIA. Why did you target these crazy California people to penetrate the most secret part of the NSA facility? Why did you describe that, he asked Pat Price. And Price said, well, I wasn't looking for your site, but the more you try and hide something, the more it shines like a beacon in psychic space. <laughs> Thank you, great, great answer for that. The gentleman here? I think, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, we understand the experimental evidence for non-locality non in space, and you describe that in a theory, and then you're describing kind of non-locality in time, and can you say a little bit more about whether, you know, non-locality in time is just as accessible as non-locality in space? Theoretically, of course, yes. 
they are symmetric. And Russell's done a whole bunch of precognitive experiences, experiments. I will say this, many years before the pyramid building was built in San Francisco, often I would have pencil and paper write down my dreams. And sometimes these gave very good information about physics. So uh, when I was in high school, I saw a pyramid in the middle of San Francisco. And I said, oh, that's not the Cheops' specification. That's what I wrote it's down. It's not Cheops, yeah. Oh, Cheops, and many years later, <laughs> I had an unusual experience of getting my car locked into a garage after I uh, gave a talk. And so uh, after, when, uh, the, day, the next day after I stayed at um, uh, Gary Zukov's place, who invited me to stay there, I woke up and looked at the image. It was like my dream many years later with a pyramid this way and Coy Tower that way, the pyramid building. So although I don't, I don't, I do know of cases where precognition has saved people's lives, including a precognitive dream I had, mm -hmm. and then you could rectify the situation. Yeah. So you could act on that information. I have to say an example of that is we had a, a secretary and she had a son who when he was like 16, 17, he, was, um, he had a dream of he was holding, I th I'm going to say an AK-47, I don't know what it really is, but a gun in his hand and he, everything was silent. He just remembered that and all of a sudden there was shooting and shooting and shooting. Well, about four years later, he was in Vietnam, and he was uh, like, yeah, uh, someone to watch. And he looked down, and he saw exactly what he saw in his dream. And he actually told people, we're going to be attacked. He got everyone up, and he basically saved his entire platoon wow. at that time from that dream. So, I mean, these things really do ha happen, and I think you have to really be aware. I know Russell records some of his dreams, right, and then things happen to him. I mean, it's not quite the same as a, a gun, but... <laughs> well, a quick question then. Is another way to word that, that we're living in multiple universes at the same time, and that we're, uh, it's all coexisting? I, I think the, the way we would say it, but I want everyone else to contribute, is that there's like an eighth dimensional, we'll call it imaginary, but I say it's not really imaginary, dimension, and, and that's, as Elizabeth would say, that's the lowest. There's even things beyond the eighth dimension, but the lowest, that actually has time, past, present, and future all linked together. So that information is already there. And the main thing with that is that if you want to change the future, then you actually start working, because your mind can work in the eighth dimension. You change it in that reality. Elizabeth or Russell or Dr. Hertak? Um. Most of the time in a precognitive experiment, uh, the person who's the psychic has an opportunity to describe what he's going to be seeing at a later time. So that um, I just did an experiment very recently. I had a, quest I had a question and answer. And I, I expect my experiments to work all the time. <laughs> That's my life experience. The people thought we were lying when we presented our, our data to the Parapsychology Association because our experiments were so successful. And it's because we expect them to be successful. We think that psychic abilities are easy, and at SRI we're working with very talented people. But I think you create an um, environment for yourself. What I wanted to know is, if I have a target, and I'm gonna, that's a very bright flashlight, would you be, and that was a target, and it was sitting on my desk, but it was turned off, and I asked you to describe the surprising object on my desk. Are you going to see it as a big cube of iron, or are you going to see it turned on with a blinding light, even though it's turned off? And I wanted to know that, because I wanted to know if that kind of a flashlight would be a good target for an experiment. So it just happened that one of my old students from years ago at Esalen came by my house and it was like a setup. So I just told her, I have something interesting on my desk. I'm not testing your ESP. I want you to help me choose a target. Could you just take five minutes from our little luncheon right now and describe the interesting object on my desk? 
and she went into a whole trip about the blinding, blinding light and the dots of electricity coming off of it. And then I walked her into my office and turned on the light. And what she had seen is the very bright flashlight that she was going to see 10 minutes in her future. Well, and she drew an excellent picture of the So Russell, what do you thing. think about, is, are we living in all four, uh, all dimensions at all times? I mean, well, <laughs> the intention is a key aspect. Uh, uh, if you intend to live in a larger world, and I'll even use a specific word here, spiritual world, a world of love and compassion, then you can access remote information. And yeah, literally, some of my published papers, uh, one, uh, one uh, theoretical work that I was working on related to complex geometry, uh, I literally dreamed it up. And I was suggested for the Nobel Prize a couple of times based on that work that came to me in a dream. So Elizabeth and I wrote a paper a number of years ago published in the Proceedings of the American Physics Society. And at the end of the paper, we said, we don't actually know how ESP works. The model that we present here doesn't generate any bad physics. And we think that it eventually, where psychic abilities will be discovered, it will be something like what we're saying, that it's a non-local interaction and it involves our, a misunderstanding of the way space-time is rather than some new kind of field. So we think that the answer is in the geometry mm -hmm. and not in the fields. We're confident of that. But when somebody says that you're experiencing multiple simultaneous universes, nobody knows the answer. We, we, don't, we don't know. If you, want, if you have in-depth questions about how does this work, Nobody knows the answer. Mm -hmm. It works something like what we're saying, mm -hmm. where you have direct access to things that are distant physically in space and time. The experience is that there's no separation, rather than you have to go to Jupiter and wait for the signal to come back. In our work with the indigenous in Brazil, it was the ability for the shamans to not only have an intention, but also an extension whether you were able to project through the geometry. It's not simply to see the geometry, but to, to extend consciousness so you can project through it. Why eight dimensions? That's the lowest number of dimensions in a space-time non-locality or a contiguous all-reality at the same time, but it's also consistent with the main body of current physics. It's consistent with what's called Lorentz invariance and the major principles upon which current physics is based. And that was to answer the guy pounding on my copy machine mm -hmm. <laughs> at the lab, uh, saying, uh, science is not denied by physics, but it's embedded in the physics the way it is, and just expanding it in a certain way. It was John Archibald Wheeler who said that the answer is in the geometry and not in the fields but he was talking about gravity. Yeah, what John Wheeler, he was a very good friend of mine and a very, uh, a mentor. And he didn't mind me being a female. <laughs> also, I, I'm as good as, uh, and better than a lot of guys. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think there's any female or male physics as physics. But what he said is, I believe the observer participates Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and the rest of the week. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so perhaps a so few what, final what, words from Dr. What, uh, Elizabeth's been working on, Russell, of course, is the, the breakthroughs of where the Laurentian invariance and complex Minkowski space all are balanced out. So the, the microcosmic and the macrocosmic converge. And so you can listen and read about the science in this book or other books of Russell's, but really, Put it to use. Uh, the guy actually that we call sometimes if we lose our keys, he's in Australia. So he could be lost in California, we call him in Australia. Doesn't matter as he said space and time, but it works. 
and you can remote view the food store, which we, uh, Elizabeth and I have done before. You can remote view where you left your car. You can remote view anything. So just use it. It's part yeah. of your birthright. It's part, it's of, part of your cosmic birthright. birthright. And we're dumbed down in our society, unfortunately, so we don't take advantage of the language of color. We the need to cancel grammar schools, a brainwashing <laughs> system. We need a new language. They weren't talking expansion. about truth and knowledge in grammar school. I mean, <laughs> Ridiculini. We want to thank all of you for making this a great yeah. experience. And I recommend Russell's great work. His new movie new coming film. out. Yeah. And we have our books in the back. And also, if anyone wants to know more about the Keys of Enoch, uh, maybe talk to Bill because we get we have meetings also occasionally on that. And if you're you interested you in know. shamanistic films and sacred <laughs> geology, we have several award-winning films also on our website. That you can yeah. go to keysofenoch.org. And I have to say, the Gates of Light we showed you had a little elaboration, but we do have some copies of Light Body and Gates of Light on the back if you're interested in DVDs. And is it needed? So go ahead. Keep compassion in your heart and keep looking up at the stars because that's yeah. where we are in both places, yeah. up there Get and down some good here. Patty, come on up. This is uh, Patty Targ. And, uh, Russell's wife, uh, can, Patty uh, Targ. Can uh, someone Thank like all of you. Kathy or...